Tonight's message is going to be a little different than the others. You heard him that most of it is going to be right on the screen. I'm going to try to use this microphone right here, and I've got a lot to say to you, so I'm going to talk fast, and I want you to listen fast. And when you get home tonight, before you go to sleep, you ought to read Daniel, the second chapter. Frankly, there are several approaches we can make to answering this question, can the Bible be trusted? I decided on this one because when I was a young fellow, I had no intention of being a preacher. I was accepted in a pre-dentistry program. I was going to be a dentist. And then the Lord called me to the ministry. And I said to him, all right, Lord, I'll do it if you want me to, but I don't want to just stand up and preach. I want something to preach. I want to be sure that I can believe what I'm saying. I want proof that the Bible can be trusted. And this was the first study that God opened to my mind. And now we want to go down with the lights and go to the screen. And I want you to keep up with me, please, as we talk to you from the Word of the Lord. We're going to the Bible. And ladies and gentlemen, it is significant to notice that the Word of God, the Bible, is very clear concerning this world and its future. And if men who have to do with shaping the future of this world would trust the Bible, there wouldn't be so much confusion and so many uh, mistakes made today by politicians and others. In Daniel chapter 2, we go back to the ancient kingdom of Babylon. Babylon in all of its glory and all of its might. The record is that Babylon was indeed the golden kingdom. And you'll understand that better as we go along. These are artists' representation of what that city must have been like. And at the time we touch base with Babylon in Daniel chapter 2, the king of Babylon was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, or some people pronounce it Nebuchadnezzar, whichever, it's the same fella, king of Babylon some 600 years before Jesus was born, and that's significant. Now, Babylon was a mighty city. It was four square. The river Euphrates flowed right through the city. And by the way, Babylon was the location of the infamous Tower of Babel. The word Babel means confusion. And Babylon in the New Testament means spiritual confusion. But there was an ancient city of Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar was its king. Babylon was a city that even today is remembered in the record books as a city of great and marvelous things. Engineers had a system of hot and cold running water way back there 600 years before Christ was born. Because of this system and because of other things the engineers planned, Babylon enjoyed natural air conditioning. It was never too hot even though the city was in a rather tropical area. Not only that, but the hanging gardens of Babylon are remembered to this day as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So wise were these men, so great its king. Babylon is remembered in history as one of the great kingdoms of all time. Nebuchadnezzar, however, in chapter 2, had gone to sleep, and while he was on his bed, he had a dream. And when he woke up, he couldn't remember the dream, and he couldn't forget it either. And if you read it, it'll tell you that he was terribly disturbed about his dream. And so he called together some folk that he had on the payroll who were supposed to tell him about dreams, and tell him about the stars, tell him all the mysteries that occurred to his mind. He paid these folk and they were highly honored. So he called them in and he said to them, I've had a dream and my soul is troubled, but I can't remember the dream. I want you to tell me what that dream was and then tell me what that dream meant. And these wise men were like a lot of them today. They couldn't remember. And by the way, amongst them were Chaldeans, magicians, and astrologers. You know what astrologers are? These are folk who track the heavens and study the stars and, and the constellations. And, and whenever two planets are in confluence, they, they have something to say. You hear them sing songs like the age of Aquarius. These are the, the, the guardians of the zodiac that you read about in your daily paper. Astrologers. Not to be confused with astronomers, which are those men who study the legitimate science of the heavens. Astrology is a false science tied up with mysticism and spiritualism. And pagans ordinarily would turn to these people, but not Christians. What do you say? But he called in his astrologers and his magicians and his wise men, and he put the question to them, and they couldn't answer. Now I'm reading from Daniel chapter 2. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. 
The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such a thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now that's the way they always buffalo. When you come up with a tough problem and the Bible tells us that the king got angry. And the king said to, it's in Daniel 2, he said, I might have known you'd try to stall for time. I put it in my language, but it's the same idea. In Daniel chapter 2, he said, I knew you'd do that. And the Bible says, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. I can hardly blame the fellow. After all, he wasn't a Christian. And since he was a pagan, it didn't bother him to put people out of the way and rub them out. And all of a sudden, he discovered that he was paying a bunch of fakes. He had believed them all these years because they could always make up something. But when there came a real test, they could not deliver. And he said they shall be put to death. Well, his soldiers immediately went out to gather them all together. And you know, there were four young men in Babylon that were considered wise men. The only problem was they weren't called in when the king called the rest of the bunch. Their names, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Would you say amen out there? Amen. But when they got ready to start killing folks, Arioch, the soldier, went over to their house and said, All right, fellas, we got to take you. The king said that all wise men should be put to death. Daniel said to the soldier, Why is this decree so hasty from the king? Why doesn't he give us time? And so Daniel went in before the king. And Daniel said, O king, give us time to consider the matter. After all, you didn't ask us before. It's not fair to put us to death when you haven't given us a chance. And so the king said, All right, you fellas, take your chance. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And Daniel got together with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that's not enough. When you've got a real problem, you've got to do more than get together with folks. You've got to get together with God. Would you say amen out there? And so these four young men got on their knees and began to pray. And when they got through praying, it was true in that day as it is today. In the words of the old Negro spiritual, a little talk with Jesus makes it right. And God came through as he always does when our trust is in him. And finally Daniel was ready. And he called Arioch and he said, go tell the king, I've got an answer. And so Daniel was brought into the presence of the king again. And now we read verse 26. Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And I like the way Daniel answered him, and you'll see it in your Bible. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? Daniel was poking a little fun at him there. He said, all right, old king, you asked a question, you've been paying these fellas, and they are associated with your religion. Can't they answer? What's wrong with your astrologers and your soothsayers, your magicians and your necromancers? What's wrong with your spirit mediums and your crystal ball gazers and your hair hiders and your powder sprinklers and your root doctors and your conjure specialists? Why can't they give you the answer? And then he turned around and said, but there is a God in heaven. And I want to say amen to that. Every time I'm in trouble, every time I'm perplexed, every time I'm discouraged and begin to work myself up into a lava, something inside of me says, Brooks, slow down a minute. There is a God in heaven. And God's people are in his hands. Therefore, we need not fear as others fear. And we need not sorrow as other sorrow. Daniel didn't say these fellows couldn't do it, but I can do it. He didn't say, I am smarter than all these others. Daniel said, O oh, king, I want you to know who gets credit for what's about to happen. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. The dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now he proceeds to tell him. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. An image. 
I can imagine the minute Daniel started saying that, Nebuchadnezzar moved on his throne and he looked to the right and to the left. He said, that's it. It's coming back to me now. That's it. That's what I saw. Daniel said, I got something else to tell you. This image's head was a fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver. His belly and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron. His feet part of iron and part of clay. My Lord, I believe if I'd had a dream like that, I'd be upset too, wouldn't you? Daniel says, here's a great metallic image. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part of iron and part of clay. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel, you're a smart man. Oh, no, King, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. This is what you saw. Now, I'm not only going to tell you what you saw, I'm going to tell you what it means. Because the same God that showed you the vision has given me a vision. And the same God that showed you this image has told me the meaning thereof. This great and terrible image that stood before you. But before I get to interpreting it, I want to tell you something else you saw in your dream. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on his feet. Where did the stone hit the image? I want you to remember that. Which that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away. There was no place found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What a dream for a king to have. Now Daniel says, I'm ready to tell you what it means. Daniel chapter 2 verses 37 and 38. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Thou art this head of gold. Would you say amen out there? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to go to school and study some history that some of you have studied in school. And it's going to come back to you as we begin to go through it. There were four great kingdoms from that day down that ruled the entire world at one time. And one of those kingdoms is the one we're talking about, the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel said, O king, you saw this great image. His head was gold, his breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part of iron and part of clay. Now as I begin to tell you about it, you are represented in this dream by the head of gold. You and your kingdom, the head of gold. Thou art this head of gold. If you understand that, say amen. Now ladies and gentlemen, that's very simple so far, isn't it? But old Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand uh, everything that Daniel was saying. He understood the interpretation of the dream, but he didn't understand that there was a God who could make things come about. Daniel said, the God of heaven gave you a kingdom. The God of heaven put you on the throne. The God of heaven gave you the power that you had. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had thought all the time that he earned all that. And so he was confused and he didn't know whether he should believe in this God or not. Daniel said to him, God is going to show you through your dream what's coming to pass in the last days. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to believe it. He had worked awful hard. His soldiers had fought awful hard to build up one of the greatest kingdoms on the top side of the earth. So as soon as he heard that, he began to think, I don't want any image that's got just a head of gold and then other metals in the body. I want an image that's all gold. Which would indicate that my kingdom will last forever. And so after the vision, and I'm diverting now to give you the history. After the vision, Nebuchadnezzar called in his artisans and he said, I want you to make an image and I want you to make it kind of like the one I dreamed about. Except I don't want any silver, I don't want any brass, I don't want any iron, I don't want any clay. I want it all gold. This fellow telling me I'm just a head of gold. I want this whole thing gold. When you get it built, I want it set up in the plains of Dura. Then I want you to get my orchestras together and my bands together. And you tell them at a certain hour every day, they are to play my kind of music. And everybody in my kingdom, when they hear the sound of the trumpet and the dulcimer and the sudak and all these other instruments, they are to bow down and worship my image. And if I can get the whole world in the frame of mind to do that, then they will pay allegiance to me forever and my kingdom and my house will reign forever. 
So they set up the image in the plains of Dura. And when the music started to play, everybody started kowtowing to Nebuchadnezzar, bowing down. But all of a sudden on the fringe of the crowd, they noticed three young men that wouldn't bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the men who didn't like them anyhow ran to the king and said, Oh king, didn't you pass a decree that everybody should bow down? Yes, I did. Well, I want to tell you, king, there are three young men that are disobeying you. It's a disgrace. And you have already said that if folks don't do what you've told them, they'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. The Bible says the king became very furious. He sent for these fellas. And he said, oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that when the music played, you wouldn't bow down? These three young men said, oh, king, it's true. Then the king said, well, fellas, did you understand my law? Yes, king, we understood your law. Then why didn't you bow down? We didn't bow down because we serve a God who says in his Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. We cannot bow down to your God and serve our God at the same time. The king said, well, fellas, don't you understand the consequences if you break my law? These young men said, oh, king, we are not even careful how we answer you. You know, when I read that, I, I like that. That's my kind of man. God's looking for somebody today who will stand for truth, though the heavens fall. God's looking for somebody today who will do right because right is right and stop compromising because the crowd goes the other way. God's looking for somebody who can walk straight while the world is walking crooked. Flying over a river the other day, the pilot said, folks, if you look out, that's the Missouri River right underneath our airplane. And I saw it curl like a snake through the mountainside. I read somewhere that rivers, rivers are crooked because they follow the line of least resistance. And that's why people are crooked too. They take the easy way. If you're going to be a Christian, you got to develop some backbone. No lily-livered coward can be a Christian. Let's say amen out there. you got to have enough strength to say, no, thank you. You've got to have enough strength to say, no, I will not do that. You've got to have enough strength to say, get your hands off me. These young fellows said, we're not in the habit of bowing down to just anything. Besides, that's the wrong God, and you got the wrong kind of music playing. We will not bow down. But listen, I'm trying to be nice to you fellows. I'm trying to reason with you. Oh, king, we're not even careful how we answer you. That's in the Bible. You're going in the fiery furnace. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But w now, wait a minute. I don't give them too much credit for that. Look, if I knew God was going to snatch me right out, I'd go in. Wouldn't you? You don't get much credit for that. What I love is what they said next. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he does not deliver us, even if we have to go in there and die, we will not bow down. Martin Luther King said, until a man finds a cause for which he's willing to die, he's not fit to live. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to love Jesus so much and love the truth of God so much that you come to the place in your experience you'd rather die than sin. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar heard that, he got mad. He said, all right, fire that furnace up seven times hotter than it ordinarily is. And the men started laying on the tar and the chaff. And when they got that furnace roaring, the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar called some of his great men, some of his strong men, and he said, tie them up. And when they had them tied, them, tied up, Nebuchadnezzar said, now take them and throw them in the fiery furnace. They're going to be an example that my authority is not to be questioned. So the men took these three boys over and they got in front of the furnace and they gave a few heaves and they let them fly the bible says the fire was so hot that it even killed the men who threw them in then the bible says that as they threw them shadrach meshach and abednego fell down into the fiery furnace now that's something to read 
But I want to tell you that while the king on his little old throne was issuing decrees and fiats, there was another king on a throne up yonder. And he saw what was going on. And he called one of those fast and powerful angels. And he said to him, my boys are in trouble. Go down there and take care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Faster than the inconceivable velocity of sound or sight. An angel came from the throne of God. And when those fellas threw those boys in, before they could hit the bottom, that angel had passed them going down. And he had cooled off the furnace and air conditioned. Now the Chutnezer's penal system. You know what burned? Read it in your Bible. The only thing that burned were the ropes that tied their hands. You want to know why the ropes burned? Because those were Babylonian ropes. Their clothes didn't even burn. The Bible says you couldn't even smell the fire in their clothes. I tell you, Christian ladies, there are certain kind of clothes you can wear that won't be destroyed. There are some Babylonian garments that'll burn up. All of a sudden, these three young men that had fallen into the furnace, instead of just uh, falling down and being consumed in smoke, stood up. And they reached out and shook hands. And they began to talk. And then all of a sudden, somebody else appeared in the furnace. And the king saw that fourth person. And the Bible says he came near, as near as he could. And he peered into the fire. And he called his soldiers over. He said, did not we cast in three? And now behold, I see four. And the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Let everybody say amen out there. Ah, oh, ladies and gentlemen, when you make up your mind to be faithful to the Lord, He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you go into the river, He's there. When you pass through the fiery furnace, He's there. In the darkness of the night, He is there. When you're languishing on a hospital bed, He is there. When your friends are talking about you, He's there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And the devil knows that. Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth. <laughs> that was cute. He should have gone in there with them. <laughs> but he said, come on out. Your God has delivered you. And he said, now I'm going to issue another decree. That if anybody speaks against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he'll be cut into pieces. Because there's no God like their God. Let's say amen. Before I go on, I want to tell you something else. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Christian or, or godly young men in battle. They didn't go to the parties, you know. And they didn't eat everything these folk ate, you know. And they didn't drink everything these folk drank, you know. But nobody paid them any attention. They just thought of them as a bunch of squares, a bunch of peculiar folks. But when they went through a trial and stood firm for the Lord, then they attracted attention. It was then that the king said, if anybody talks against their God, he shall be put to death. You know, we got a bunch of fanatics in the church today. Some of them say, I don't eat this and I don't drink that. Nobody paying you any mind. It's when you stand up for principle that you're letting your light shine. It's when you stand for truth, even though it goes against you, that you're letting your light shine. It's when you stand up for God, when everybody else is going the other way, that you let your light shine. All right, let's go back to Daniel 2. Daniel said, oh, king, you might not like it, but another kingdom's going to arise. There it is in Daniel 2, 39. And after thee, meaning you're going to pass off and your folks are going to pass off. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, just as silver is inferior to gold. Now, all you got to do is go back to world history and you will know that the next kingdom to rule the world after Babylon was Medo-Persia. Today, it's called something else, Iraq and Iran. The Shah of Iran claims to be a descendant of those ancient kings of Persia. Now you're putting it together, aren't you? Daniel said, another kingdom's going to arise inferior to you. And that kingdom was the kingdom of Persia. Well, Belshazzar finally came to the throne. Nebuchadnezzar was dead and gone. Belshazzar was king in Babylon. 
At least he was vice regent in Babylon. His daddy was the king, but he was always God. So this man sat on the throne and, and took all the honors. One night he decided to have himself a party. He called in his orchestra. He called in his naked dancing girls. And he told all of his big shots, you all come and don't come alone. Bring not only your wives, but your girlfriends and your concubines. We're going to have ourselves a bash. Saturday night fever. And they all got together. I read it to you the other night. The Bible says when he had tasted the wine, he sent for the vessels from the Lord's house. And they brought in God's sacred vessels. And they poured wine into them. And they began to drink. And they were having quite a time. And the band was playing. And the girls were dancing. And everybody who was anybody was at that party. The Bible says he gave that party for his lords, his, his captains, his generals. All of his officers were there. Except Daniel. You know, there's some parties a Christian doesn't get invited to. Huh? Young lady said to me one day, Pastor Brooks, I want to be a Christian, but I don't know how to get rid of my friends. I said, all you got to do is start being a Christian and your friends will get rid of you. When you're living right, they don't want you at their parties. See, if you're living right, you pour cold water on the proceedings. When you're living right, they don't want you around. They can't let it all hang out if you're there. I can imagine the scribe was sending out the invitations. And finally, he came to Daniel's name. Daniel was a prime minister in Babylon. And I can imagine he said, now listen, king, how are we going to leave Daniel out of this thing and yet conform to our own laws of protocol? And I can imagine the king said, oh, forget Daniel. He's out on business anyhow. Let's not call him in. We plan to have a good time. And if we bring Daniel in, there's some things we can't do. It ought to be that way with Christians. You see, in my house, there's some things you can't do. I have a son, a fine boy. He went through a little period, and one day he brought home a record. And he knows he got stereo in his room. But he knows that in our house, in our house, there's certain kinds of music we don't listen to. And we don't fuss about it and make a lot over it. It's just that that's the standard that's been set. And we have talked about it. So one day I went into his room. He and I were in there talking. We're great buddies. And, and I picked up his album. And I said, son, where'd you get this? He said, a friend of mine let me have it. It was a record by Earth, Wind, and Fire. I said to him, son, and I was just smiling. Don't have to fuss and cuss. I said, son... We don't play this kind of music here, and you know that. So I tell you what you better do. You better come down to earth and deliver this back like the wind, or it's going to end up in the fire. We can't have Daniel there. So while they were dancing, and while they were carousing, and while they were flirting, and while they were drinking, suddenly there came a bloodless hand out of the sleeve of darkness and went over against the candlestick and began to write in great Hebrew characters on the wall of the banquet hall, meanie, meanie, tickle you for certain. And the Bible says Belshazzar got so scared, his knees began to smite together. Paleness came over his countenance. What's the matter, king? A while ago you were everything. What's wrong with you now? I can't read the writing. If anybody will read it and tell me what it says, I'll make them third ruler in Babylon. I'll put a golden chain about their neck. I'll clothe them with scarlet. I'll bring them into the royal family. And again, they got the astrologers and the magicians and the wise men and the philosophers and the PhDs. And they brought them all in, but they couldn't read it. Let me tell you something tonight. God's will can only be understood by those who are willing to do God's will. Would you say amen? You got to be a child of God to understand the word of God. And there they were, screaming in terror, when the queen mother heard the raucous sound and came running into the banquet hall. And she saw Belshazzar standing there trembling. And she said, son, what's wrong? He said, look at that writing on the wall. And my astrologers and my big shots and all these folk who put all this stuff in the newspaper, they can't tell me what it means. 
And that queen mother looked up there, and the first thing she said was, There is a man in Babylon whose name is Daniel. Now, i got to stop there a minute. You know, I really hate to be late, and I haven't been late yet. But I have to stop. When they were sending out the invitations, Daniel was a square. When they were sending out the invitations, Daniel was a country hick. When they were sending out the invitations, Daniel was approved. When they were sending out the invitations, Daniel was old-fashioned. Are you following me? When they were sending out the invitations, Daniel was unpopular, a nobody. But when a crisis came and God moved in the darkness, writing his message of doom, all of a sudden the queen mother said, there is a man in Babylon. You gotta be a man to be a child of God. And people won't think much of you while things are going smooth. But when that day comes when the mountains shall move out of their places, when that day comes that the heavens will split wide open and Christ shall be seen riding down in space to gather his people home, you're gonna be a man. Daniel was sent for. And Daniel came in and there were all his fellow officers, half drunk and half naked people standing around, all of them white, all of them pale, all of them shivering, came into the presence of the king and they said, oh king, what can I do for you? The king said, Daniel, look up there. If you tell us what that says, I'll make you the third ruler in Babylon. I'll put a golden chain. Daniel looked up there and said, no king, I'm going to tell you free. You know why he said third ruler? Because he wasn't even number one. He was number two. What he assumed was that he would continue, his daddy would continue, and Daniel would be number three. But Daniel knew what the writing said, and he didn't want any part of a deal like that. He said, oh king, I'm going to tell you for nothing. Keep your golden chain, keep your crown, keep your scarlet robe. That is the writing of God. And it says, today, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Tonight, your kingdom and your soul shall be required of you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, while Daniel interpreted the handwriting on the wall, already the soldiers of Cyrus, of the Medes and Persians, were undermining the walls of Babylon and were getting ready to come in and kill everything in sight. In Isaiah 45 and verse 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gate shall not be shut. That text was written hundreds of years before the man was born. Can the Bible be trusted when God can name a man hundreds of years before he's born and say, I'm going to use you? To take advantage of the gates that have not been kept? Why weren't these soldiers keeping the gates? They were drunk. And Cyrus led his army there. And that night, the head of gold passed away. That night, mighty golden Babylon burned. That night, Belshazzar died. That night, the officers at the banquet lay in pools of their own blood. That night, the breast and arms of silver took the scepter of the world. Let everybody say amen out there. Now, it was while this king ruled that some folks got jealous of Daniel again. And they went in under the king and they said, Oh king, we think you're such a wonderful king. We want you to pass a law that, it, that, that, that only your God can be worshipped. And anybody caught praying to another God can be thrown into a lion's den. See how it all fits together? And the king was so flattered that he signed the decree. Now in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, once the king signed a decree, it was irrevocable. It could not be altered. That was the eternal law. That was the constitution of the Medes and the Persians. So the king signed it. But the king liked Daniel. He didn't know what these fellows were doing. Let's read what the Bible says. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault 
found in him. That's found in Daniel chapter 6. Don't you wish folk could say that about you? They looked and watched and peeked and meddled, but they couldn't find one fault with Daniel. So they came to the conclusion, if we're going to get anything on him, it's got to be on the, uh, the way he worships his God. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And that's when they went in unto the king and got him to sign that foolish decree. And as soon as it was published, then they went spying on Daniel. And sure enough, every day, three times a day, Daniel fell down on his knees with his eyes toward Jerusalem and cried out to the true God. Would you say amen out there? Now Daniel knew about the decree. You know what he could have done? He could have drawn the window blinds and closed the door and went sneaking around praying in private. I'm happy to tell you tonight that when a man is a child of God, he's supposed to be a public witness. The Bible says if you've got a candle, you don't put it under a bushel, you put it up on a housetop so that everybody can see it. Daniel was not ashamed to worship God. Would you say amen out there? So he went on praying like he always did. And while he was praying, these guys were spying. And as soon as they found him, they went back and told the king. And even though the king liked Daniel, he couldn't break his own law. Then the king commanded. And they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Now that's a pagan king talking to Daniel. He said, Your God will deliver you. But I cannot break my law. You've got to be thrown in. So they took Daniel out. And they pulled back the lid. And the minute they did, those hungry lions that hadn't been fed for a while let up a roar that would almost curdle your blood. And they took Daniel over. And fearing to get too close, they gave him a shove. And Daniel tumbled head over heels down into the lion's den. But what they didn't understand was that same angel that had air conditioned that furnace was already on the wing. And when Daniel hit the bottom, those lions sprang forward, but they couldn't get their mouths open. All they could do was muzzle Daniel and purr like house cats. Somebody said the reason they couldn't eat Daniel was he had too much backbone. Let's say amen out there. All night long, they walked around smelling Daniel, but they couldn't bite him. Early the next morning, the king got up. He couldn't sleep. He forgot about his servants and his bodyguards. He went running down to the lion's den. And he cried into the den, Oh, Daniel, was your God able? Daniel replied, Oh, king, live forever. My God, whom I serve, has sent his angel and locked the lion's jaw. The king turned around and yelled to the top of his voice. And his servants ran out with ladders. Get Daniel out of there. And bring me those birds that made me sign that decree to get Daniel in trouble. And they took those fellas and threw them in. And the Bible says the lions didn't even leave their bones. That happened under the Medes and the Persians. Just thought I'd bring that in. Historically. Now ladies and gentlemen, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in verse 39. And another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule of all the earth. The first kingdom was gold, Babylon. The second kingdom was silver, Media Persia. Now comes a third kingdom of brass, represented by the belly and thighs of the image. And who ruled the world after the Medes and the Persians? Anybody here who has studied classical history knows that the next ruler of the world was Alexander the Great of Greece. Would you say amen out there? You can read this in high school. The third kingdom would now bear sway over the entire world. The Greek historian Arian says, I am persuaded there was no nation, city, nor people then in being, whither his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Talking about Alexander the Great. Ladies and gentlemen, this man at just 37 years of age ruled the entire world. So great a soldier was he, so mighty a general was he, that he and his nation of Greece ruled the entire world when he was just 37 years old. But with all that power, he couldn't conquer himself. 
and he died of a drunken debauch just shortly after he took the scepter of the world he drank liquor and drank himself to death and now Daniel says a fourth kingdom what kingdom a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these things, shall it break in pieces and ruin. Ladies and gentlemen, the kingdom that ruled the world after Greece was mighty Rome. You know that. You remember that from high school. In the second century, Hippolytus wrote of Rome, Rejoice, blessed Daniel, thou hast not been in error. Already the iron rule. Rome, the kingdom of iron. The images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. So wrote Edward Gibbon. And by the way, Edward Gibbon was not even a believer. He was infidel. And yet he understood the prophecy of Daniel and believed it. Can the Bible be trusted? Rome ruled the world. There sat on the throne of Rome a Caesar, that means king. His name was Augustus. The month of August was named after him. August only had 30 days, and since Julius Caesar had named July after himself, August, Augusta wanted a month with 31 days like July. And so he took a day from February and stuck it on the end of August. That's how important he thought he was. And today you got 31 days in August. Augusta said, I want all the world to be taxed. This decree went forth from Caesar of Rome. And there was a virgin just getting married, nine months pregnant. Got to go to the county seat to pay taxes. You following it? Rome was ruling the world. And it was an imperial Roman decree. That made Joseph do what no thinking man would ever do. Take his pregnant wife 75 miles as the crow flies. When she's expecting a baby any day. But I got to tell you something. In Micah chapter 5 beginning with verse 2. Five, six hundred years before Jesus was born. God had said, out of thee shall he come. O Bethlehem Ephrata. You know, if you just say Bethlehem, well, you got Bethlehem over there and you got Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. You wouldn't know which one. So God said, Bethlehem Ephrata, or that's like saying Bethlehem in Ephrath, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You can't miss that, can you? God said in Micah 5, Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Ephrath. Now, Joseph and Mary didn't live in Bethlehem, they lived in Nazareth. Either Joseph has got to get Mary down there, or the Bible is a lie. Can the Bible be trusted? If he doesn't go, the Word of God is a lie. God really sticks his neck out, doesn't he? Seems like to me, if God had been like us, he would have chosen a virgin down in Bethlehem. Made it easy. But he didn't. He chose one in Nazareth. Now, if he's going to choose one in Nazareth, seems like to me... If you're going to do that, then you ought to somehow get word to her and Joseph to go down to Bethlehem early and get an apartment and be there as the baby is coming so that when the time comes, you won't have any problem. But God didn't do that, did he? God let us stay right there for nine months. Babies do. Now, what would get a man to take his wife that far when there are no ambulances, no helicopters, he didn't even have a cot. All he had was a donkey. Now, what man would put a pregnant woman on a donkey and go 75 miles? You see, in the days of Caesar Augustus, there went forth a decree. This was no suggestion or good idea. This was a decree. And when Caesar spoke, you jumped. He didn't care anything about Jews, and he cared even less about a pregnant woman. 
you go. So Joseph had to go or die. Can the Bible be trusted? Now he had to travel slowly because of her delicate condition. And while he's traveling slowly, all these other pilgrims who've got to go to the same place are running past him. He has to stop and let her lie down on the grass and rest. And these other folks are rushing on. Rushing on! They all there before sunset and they've taken up every hotel room. They've taken up every tourist uh, house. They've taken up every motel. <laughs> they got everything occupied. And here in the nighttime, all by himself with his wife comes Joseph. And he knocks on the door of the hotel. Oh man, who do you think you are? We're full. He goes over to the next hotel, the Bethlehem Hilton. My wife is pregnant. Can you, who do you think? We don't care about your wife. We've been book selling all day. And then he goes on over to, 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 to the Holiday Inn. Hey, can we get in here? No! Who do you think you are? Laughing in his face. But sir, my wife is pregnant. Doesn't matter. Our room's been sold out for a long time. From one place to another, he went with his pregnant wife. And the pains of travail are beginning to be felt. They're getting closer and closer. And she knows what this means. Because she's heard mothers talk about it. Joseph, something's got to be done. And finally, he knocks on her door. And with contempt. The man says, no, you can't get a room, but I got a barn out there. <laughs> you want to use that? I'll take it. So away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Amen. Born in a stable because there was no room in the inn. The Savior of the world. Born in a cow barn. The cattle were lowing. But they couldn't wake up the baby Jesus, the little song says. Silent night. Holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child. Holy infant so tender and mild. The Lord Jesus Christ was born. And at the same time, shepherds were in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. And suddenly there appeared a great and bright light in the heavens. And when the so shepherds looked up and saw it, they were so afraid. And out of that light came an angel, the messenger of God, and said unto them, Fear not, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Don't be afraid. The Savior has come. And they fell down and worshipped. Where can we find him? Which one of the hotels is he in? Is he in the hospital at Bethlehem? This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger of straw. You shall find him amongst the oxen and the sheep. And they went to where Jesus lay, and they worshipped him. The shepherds who were watching their flocks, then there were the wise men, saw a star came from the east following that star because they had read the Bible and they knew something about the sign and they knew something about the scriptures. They were looking for Jesus to come. Everybody today that's looking for Jesus to come is a wise man. Would you say amen out there? They got to Jerusalem and the priests didn't know anything. The preachers didn't know. They were disturbed out of their sleep. What do you fellas want? We saw a star. We're looking for the person. Oh, get out of here. You're waking folks up. There's a preacher sleep. So they went on out again, and there was the star again, and it led them to the place where Jesus was. And they worshiped him with gold and myrrh and frankincense. And then the devil tried to destroy Jesus. God sent an angel and told Joseph to take the child and flee to Egypt. My wife and I have been to a little town in Egypt called Matareya. And they've got a place there where they say Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus pitched their camp in Egypt land. We've been there and photographed it. And then they went back home after Herod died and the child grew and waxed strong. Grew up like all children. When he was 12 years old, he went to the temple. Rome ruled the world. Went to the temple and confounded the doctors knowing so much about scripture. Finally, he became a man. 
And Jesus was tempted of the devil and he passed every test. Would you say amen out there? Preached to the thousands by the sea of Galilee. Healed the sick and raised the dead. Drove the money changers out of the temple. Jesus, the Son of God, raised up Jairus' daughter. Conquering the greatest enemy to man, death. Jesus, the Son of God, who was verily divine, exercised his power and his purity. He was the light in a world of darkness. He was a truth where lies and error were held. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what did they do? They despised him. They despised him because of his goodness. They despised him because of his truth. And they conspired to put him to death. Now, in order to bring this off, they've got to have the cooperation of Rome. Why couldn't the Jews just do it on their own? Because Rome ruled the world. Rome was in charge. And the Jews had to come before Rome to get permission. And while they were working it out, our Savior went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he agonized with his father. There he cried unto the Lord until blood broke through his skin, painting his garments red. Jesus was prostrated out there. Devils and demons surrounding him. It seemed that he would expire in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Christ kept on praying. He would not give up. And he cried out, Father, take this cup from me. Then when he thought of me, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And as he prayed, the mob was getting ready. And when Jesus had finally been strengthened by an angel, they looked and saw the mob approaching, led by a hairy harlot whose name was Judas. And here they come to arrest the Savior of the world. And this mob was led by Roman soldiers because Rome ruled the world. Judas stepped forward and kissed him. And Christ submitted to the authority of Rome for a little while. They took him into court, a farce of a trial. A riotous mob screaming for his blood. And the man in charge was a Roman governor. Pontius Pilate held the destiny of Christ in his hand for a little while and admitted to that crowd, I find no fault in this man. That's what Pilate said. But he didn't have the backbone to do what he knew he should. The Bible says he wanted to please the people. And so he ordered Jesus disrobed and, and he ordered him humiliated. And he ordered him whipped. And he was whipped with a Roman whip. That cat of nine tails. Nine rawhide strands with bits of flint and steel tied on the end. And when a soldier brought that whip down, that steel would bite and go underneath the skin. And when he snatched it back, he ripped open the hide of our Lord so that his back looked like a raw beefsteak. That's how they treated Jesus. The Romans knew how to punish you. And Rome ruled the world. And finally, they brought a Roman cross and dropped it on his shoulders. The Romans had borrowed this implement from the Carthaginians. They used it to bring out the very worst agony. They used it because a man could stay on the cross for as much as 72 hours without dying. They knew how to set the nails to miss vital blood vessels. And they knew how to hang you up there and just let you stay there day and night for four days. The tongue would swell up in the mouth. The eyes would pop because breathing was hard. And buzzards would come and pick out the eyeballs while there was still life. That's the death they chose for Jesus. A Roman death on a Roman cross. And as they were leading him out, because he hadn't had food or drink, and because he had lost so much blood with a beating, he stumbled beneath the cross. The whip came down and they piled it on his bruised shoulders again. Again he fell under the cross, and he fell under the cross until the Romans themselves were touched with mercy. And they thought, somebody has got to help him. Who will help him? And the Bible tells me there was a black man there, Simon of Cyrene. And Jesus stumbling beneath the cross, suddenly felt a measure of relief as the 300-pound hot wood was gradually lifted up and Christ, feeling the relief, looked to see who was giving him a hand. And there was a black arm curled under the cross. Simon Niger, Simon the Black, 
was lifting the cross from the soldier from the shoulders of our Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, black folks been carrying crosses ever since. But I want to tell you something. Jesus will never forget that it was a black man that helped him with his cross. He went on to the crest of dead man's hill. And then the God who had made the heavens and the earth laid down on that cross and submitted those powerful hands. With the batting of his eyes, he could have destroyed the whole lot of them. With a nod of his head, the entire city would have crumbled. With the extension of his finger, the scepter of the universe could have moved the elements. But he submitted. He had already said, nobody can kill me. I lay down my life. If they kill me, there would be no love. I couldn't help myself. But I'm laying down my life because I love you. I'm laying down my life for you. And I tell you, I'm going to take it up again. Romans held his arms down. A Roman spike, crusted with rust, was placed in the center of his palm. And a Roman soldier raised a hammer and brought it down. You could hear the stuttering, shuddering sound of quivering flesh as that spike drove through and found its home in the wood. And the hammer rang. Christ, the Son of God, being nailed to a cross, the arm that had made the world fastened. He was hanging there now. And every time his heart would beat, blood would pulsate out around the head of the nail. The fountain for our cleansing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stain. And the proof is that a dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Christ saved that thief. He can save me. His blood is efficacious to cover my sins. And a Roman soldier presided. And finally when one of them wanted to make sure Christ was dead, he lifted a spear and drove the head of a Roman spear into the side of our Lord and he yielded up the ghost and he died and they brought him down the devil had had his day but things are not over till God says so they took him on off from the top of the mountain and and they laid him in Joseph's tomb wherein never before man was laid and they carefully folded the grave's clothes about him And then they went home to get some spices to prepare his body. And the Sabbath was on its way. So they were going to wait until Sunday to come and anoint his body. But the Bible tells me that the devil wanted to keep Jesus in that grave. Devil wanted to make sure he didn't get away. So the devil not only got the Romans to seal the tomb with the authority of Rome and with Roman mortar. But he got a a, a battalion of soldiers to come and make sure that nobody tampered with it. And then the devil and all of his hosts came. All of the devils that the devil has were there. If all of them together could keep Jesus in the tomb past the third day, they got him forever. And you and I would be hopelessly lost. Oh, but I got some good news tonight. Even though Jesus was in the tomb, just as he said he would, On Easter Sunday morning, he got up early. The Bible says he folded the grave's clothes. You know, sometimes if I'm at home in the bed and I get up to have a snack and I plan to go back to bed, I don't make it up. But when I make up the bed, I'm through with it. See, the Lord got up. And if he were going to die again, he would have left things as they were. But the Bible says he folded the grave's clothes. He said, I am now alive forevermore. And I've got the key to death and hell. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He conquered death. The devil's best weapon 
When Jesus walked out of the tomb that Sunday morning, he stopped and looked back at it. And with mighty and holy contempt, he shouted at the tomb and said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is your victory? I've overcome you. And about the golden taps of my own girdle, I got the key hanging here. I got the key to death and hell. And even though you lock up my saints for a little while, when I come, I'm going to unlock the grave. And sleeping saints are going to come out of those graves to everlasting life. That's why you don't have to fear anything when Jesus speaks to you. You don't even have to fear death. If you die, you're going to live again. Because he got the key to hell. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. But Rome ruled the world, and now we got to close out. Daniel said in Daniel 2.41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, the kingdom shall be partly weak and partly strong. Ladies and gentlemen, can the Bible be trusted? I want you to watch this now. The feet of the image, iron and clay, part strong, part weak. Never again would one nation rule the entire world. In the history of the world, the last kingdom to do that was Rome. Immediately after Rome fell, the kingdom was divided into ten kingdoms. By great, great heathen soldiers like Attila the Hun. You've heard about him. You read about him. These barbarians rode out of the Caucasus Mountains. They were so wild, they wouldn't even eat vegetables. And they ate their meat raw, heated under their saddles. And they sacked Rome and divided it up, just like the Bible said, 600 years before Jesus was born. Rome fell in 476 A.D. And from that time till now, never again has a kingdom ruled the entire world. The Bible said, they shall not cleave one to another. But there have been some men who tried to make the Bible a lie. There have been some men who said, I'm going to rule the entire world. Even though it was divided, just like ten toes on the image, there were ten divisions of that empire. Those ten divisions were the Franks, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Anglo-Saxons, and so forth. Today, you know them as England and Germany and France and Italy and so forth. Those kingdoms still remain divided. Some are strong, some are weak. And yet there have been men who said, I'm going to rule the whole world. I don't have time to tell you about them. Charlemagne, Charles V, Napoleon Bonaparte, he almost did it. Napoleon Bonaparte said that he was going to rule the entire world. But the Bible says God sets up kings and takes them down. Ask Dick Nixon. In prison, Napoleon is reported to have said, I wanted to found a European system. A European court of laws, a European court of appeals. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. That's what he had in mind. Napoleon Bonaparte said that, but God stopped him. You know what God used? Snowflakes. He didn't even need an atomic bomb. God just sent enough snow, turned him back from Russia, headed him towards Waterloo. And at Waterloo, God settled his issue. Would you say amen out there? And the little caucus, little, little uh, as a corporal they called him from Corsica, died in exile. I don't have time to read that. Napoleon said it was God that did it. Well, you'd think men would learn. But along came handsome Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. He said, I'm going to rule the world. And he tried. He started World War I. You remember it. Finally, the doughboys were drawn into it. And they got the socks beat out of them. He said, I'm going to rule the world. But he died a woodchopper in Holland. The Allies won the battle. God's word cannot be broken. Would you say amen? That's Kaiser Wilhelm in his old age. I don't have time to read these. Let's rush them along. But there came another maniac, his name was Adolf Hitler. He said, I'm going to rule the whole world, and I'm going to people it with a master race. I'm going to kill off all the Jews and all the blacks, and I'm going to make everybody superior. He said, I'm going to rule the whole world or die. You know what he did? You better believe it. And I was alive when that happened. The Third Reich terror terrorized the entire world. With him was Ildus, the, the pompous puppet of Italy. Benito Mussolini. And with them was a third party in the Axis powers, Hirohito of Japan. And the three of them formed a union to take over the whole world. And again we had to go to war. And again our sons had to die. But again God 
gave victory to the allied nations. And what happened to these powers that said they would rule the world? They ended up in the trash can. Like all powers must end up when they go against the buckler of God. Now we have come down beyond that. Dr. Harold Uray, he is one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, said as a scientist, I tell you, there must never be another war. H.G. Wells said the same thing. If we keep blundering into war, we're coming to Armageddon. But in spite of that, maniacs still rise up and say we're going to rule the whole world. Joe Stalin said Russia's going to take over. Khrushchev said we will bury you. Both of them are buried. The word of God still stands. There will be no more world rulers. And in the days of these kings, Daniel 2.44, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall not be destroyed, and that kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall reign forever. Well, what's that all about? Let's go on. I don't have time to read all of that. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on what? Remember I told you to remember that? Now Daniel said, O king, I've shown you these kingdoms. I've shown you the division. In the days of the divisions, when some are strong and some are weak, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. And thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands. There's an old Negro spiritual that the quartet boys sing. I'm looking for that stone that was hewed out the mountain. Well, who in the world is that stone? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Christ the rock is coming back to this world again in the days of the divided kingdoms down in the feet and toes of the image and Christ is going to throw down the kingdoms of this world he's going to set up his own kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness take hope ladies and gentlemen this world seems to be out of control but there's somebody in charge there's somebody looking on and in the fullness of time he's going to throw down the censor he's going to stand up from between God and man and he's going to shout to the universe it is done and all of a sudden the rock is coming the rock is coming all of the ground is sinking sand Peter said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise Oh, when Jesus comes, it's going to be something. People are talking about a secret rapture. Christ is coming back in majesty, glory, and power to settle the issue with sin. The heavens will pass away with cataclysmic explosions. The rock is coming. It's going to throw down the kingdoms of the world. And everything that you love down here, except your character, is going to be torn down. Cadillac cars that we sell our souls for. Nice houses that we put ahead of God gonna be smashed to smithereens. Bank accounts are gonna be left in the bank. Gold and silver will be thrown in the street and nobody will pick it up. What's going on? The stone is coming. Coming to tear down the kingdoms of the world. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Christ is coming, ladies and gentlemen. That is the hope of the world. Can the Bible be trusted? If the first part of that vision came true, why should I doubt the second part? If everything Daniel said has happened to a T, why should I doubt the last part? That Jesus will come and set up his kingdom. So what I'm concerned about is is being ready when he comes how about you when Jesus sets up that kingdom I want to be with the saints I want to be with that group that Christ spoke to when he said blessed are the meek for they shall inherit what yes down here now you can't get a hold of a thing every time you think you're getting ahead Uncle Sam comes in with tax the landlord comes in with the rent and if you think you own it, the government comes in with taxes again, and the folks who really own it foreclose. You don't own anything, it seems, down here. But the rock is coming. And he said, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. He's going to give you a home with a clear deed. Won't have to pay any rent. The lion and the bear shall lie down with the fatling and the cow, and a little child shall lead them. He shall put his hand in the, do the hole of a cockatrice and not be burned. Oh, I want to live with Jesus when he sets up his kingdom. Don't you?
I'm tired of politicians and their vain and empty promises. And this is the time of the year. And if you listen to them, you'd think they're going to be so nice to you. They come out and shake your hand and kiss your baby. And once they get in office, you can't see them with a five-week appointment. But when Jesus sets up his kingdom, whenever I get ready, I can go straight to the throne and bow down before him and tell him how much I love him and talk to him about what I had to go through down here. I want to be with him when he sets up his kingdom. When the saints go marching in, Daniel concluded by saying, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is Sure, let everybody say amen out there. Now you want to know where we are? I'll tell you where we are. We're not in the head that passed away before Jesus was born. We're not in the breast and arms of silver that passed off the stage of action in 168 B.C. We're not in the belly and thighs of brass. I'm sorry, that passed off 331 B.C. The belly and thighs of brass passed off the stage of action in 168 B.C when Rome started ruling the world. We are not in the legs of iron. They passed away in 476 A.D. And since then, we've been down in the feet, down in the toes. The next great event is the coming of Jesus. Let everybody say amen out there. You don't have to worry about Russia ruling the world. They're not going to rule anything. You don't have to worry about America taking over the world. Nobody's going to do it. You don't have to worry about any of these fools blowing up the whole world. Jesus said, I'm reserving that right for myself. When I come, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Let's say amen. And even though the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing that sits on the throne of the universe, the God of heaven, King Jesus, quietly working out the counsels of his own will, when he gets ready, the end will come. Not until then. Now the question is, where will you spend eternity? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to apologize to you, and I'm going to make you a promise this won't happen again. I went a little overtime because I put all those slides in there. But if 10 minutes is going to kill you, then I'll come to your funeral. <laughs> but right now, I've got something important to say to you. As we close this service tonight, I believe in the Word of God. I could preach a different sermon every night like that. Show you mathematically where the Word of God came to pass right on time. Can the Bible be trusted? There is a basis for faith for every reasonable man. If you want to be a fool, you can't prove anything to you. But if you want to be reasonable, God has given us enough evidence that he's running things, that his word cannot fail. And tonight has just been a sample of that. Jesus is coming soon. Don't you want to be ready? If you do, stand on your feet and let us pray. Let's tell the Lord. That we want to be ready when he comes. We want to be a part of his kingdom. Oh, blessed Lord, we're running late tonight, but we thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your word that's so clear and so encouraging, so strong. Thank you for your word that cannot be broken. Lord, if all these infidels and all these atheists and all these agnostics would get together and give a little money, they could break the word. If there's nothing to the word... All they got to do to prove the Bible a lie is set up one king over all the world. And the Bible will be proved a lie, but they can't do it, for the scriptures cannot be broken. They shall not cleave one to another. The next world kingdom will be that of Jesus Christ, and we want to be in that kingdom when you come. So look upon us in mercy tonight. Lord, please, please captivate our minds with your truth. Don't let us go home and forget what we've heard. Don't let us be entertained by the word, but let the word be in us a seed that germinates and comes alive to bear fruit. Oh, Lord, we're not worthy, but we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. There is hope for you in this mad, mad age. There is hope 
for you. It's written on the sacred page. There is hope, I say. Just let Jesus be your friend. There's hope in Christ for you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. May he keep you through the night. And tomorrow night, a subject you can see as well as hear, God's looking glass. Come see yourself in it. Oh, blessed Lord, keep us safe until then. And bring us back to praise thee, we beg in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good night, friends. God bless you.